What's up everybody? Today we're going to be looking at 10 basic photography terms explained which beginners should know. So stated in the intro, what we're going to do today is look over 10 basic terms which beginner photographers should know. If you don't know these terms, then it's a great learning video so you can watch over and find out what these terms mean and how you can use them. Number one that we're going to be looking at is depth of field. So what is depth of field? Depth of field is how much of an image is in focus versus how much of it is blurred. When using a narrow depth of field, it blurs out everything apart from the subject. Whereas when you use a large depth of field, the majority of the photograph is in focus. So for example, if you want to take a picture of a person in front of some mountains or some hills or whatever background you want it is and you want the person in focus but the background out of focus if you use a narrow depth of field that's how you achieve that however if you want the opposite if you want the person in focus and the background in focus then you need to use a wider depth of field so you can have more things in focus so that is what depth of field is however to achieve depth of field what you need to do is adjust the aperture and that leads us on to number two which we're looking at and it's aperture aperture is used to control the amount of light which gets into the sensor and also affects the depth of field field when using different apertures. For example, a larger aperture like f2.8 that leaves a massive amount of light to come in the lens. As a result of that you'll get a brighter image and you'll also have a shallow depth of field. And the opposite spectrum when you change the aperture to say f22 something like that, the image is going to be much darker because there's less light coming into the shot. However, more of your image will be in focus. For example, if you're shooting portraits on f1.8 or f2.8, your field of view which you can focus on is very, very narrow. So for example, you may take a picture of someone's face, you focus on the eye, however, the nose and anything back there will be out of focus. Whereas if you use something, maybe if you go to f12 or f16, you have more of the face in focus. So if you focus on the eye, your nose will be in focus, your head will be in focus, and also the foreground and background. So it depends on what sort of image you want to produce as to what aperture you would use. If you're shooting in the dark and you don't have flashes, and you're using all the, the light which is coming in around your environment, if you shoot with f1.8 or f2.8, that'll let in more light to the sensor, so your image will be much brighter, rather than shooting at something like f22, where your image will be much darker. That leads us on to number three, which is shutter speed. Your shutter speed is basically how long the shutter is left open to capture light and data to the sensor when you're taking a photograph. Generally, there's a fast shutter speed and a slow shutter speed. They do two different things when you're using the camera. For example, your fast shutter speed, so 1 over 2 40th of a second or something much higher, or 1 over 1,000th of a second, you can use that to capture motion and freeze it. So someone's running or something like that. If you use that fast shutter speed, you can capture that movement when it's frozen in time. Then on the other perspective, if you use a slow shutter speed at 1 over 30th of a second or something much slower, so even 1 second, two seconds. That is when you're going to end up with a blurry image or it's going to capture lots of data. For an example with a slow shutter speed if you're taking a picture of water and you have your camera on a tripod and you set it to two three seconds that photograph is going to capture all of that movement of the water and it's going to make it look silky smooth because it's captured all of that. What you can do on the other hand is when someone is running you can use a slow shutter speed rather than a fast shutter speed and with doing this what you can do is use the technique called panning where you follow the subject like this and you have a slow shutter speed and what that does is it blurs the background when you're moving across but if you're moving at the same pace as the subject that subject will be frozen on the picture. So as stated with the tripod earlier if you're using a fast shutter speed generally you can get away without using a tripod and your pictures will still be sharp and not blurry or shaky. However, if you're using a slow shutter speed, generally you need to use a tripod or use something to hold the camera steady throughout the amount of time that the shutter speed is open. Time to move on to number four, and this one is ISO. What the ISO does is adjust the sensitivity of the sensor to light. So as a basic method, the lower the ISO, the less light's gonna get let in. However, the higher the ISO, the more light you can get in. So if you're in a dark environment, you need to use a high ISO. If you're outside, then you use a lower ISO. But what what I recommend is if you can get away with it use a slow shutter speed or an aperture of f28 f18 to let in more light rather than bumping up ISO. The issue which comes with bumping up your ISO higher is that you get noise in your image because the higher the ISO the more grain and noise you get with it. So ideally what you need to use is a low ISO especially in well-lit environments and only bump up the ISO when you need to in a dark environment. However the only other alternative is adding extra lights so you can use a smaller ISO but for example weddings and things like that where you can't add in the extra lights 
then sometimes it's okay to bump up the ISO just so you can capture that moment. Number five on the list is bokeh. Sometimes it's also known as bokeh or bokehlicious. Bokeh is the quality of out of focus or blur in the photograph which is created by the lens. It is not the blur which is on the photograph in the foreground or the background. Back in the day when I used to watch Digital Rev TV on YouTube and used to watch Kai, he was always mentioned bokeh and bokehlicious and is quite popular in photography and no matter where you go, you'll see something mentioned about bokeh. One of the reasons why it's popular is because it makes your photographs more visually interesting and more appealing. The reason behind that is because when you have bokeh, it makes you visually focus on the bit which is in focus. The word comes from the Japanese and as a translation, it translates as blur and not the band who had the country house. The foreground and background blur is called shallow depth of field, which we discussed about in the previous one when we used an aperture and depth of field. The quality and the feel of the background and foreground blur and also the lights, i.e. sometimes bokeh balls when you have the lights behind us which are blurred, that is known as the bokeh rather than the blur itself. Number six on the list is color temperature. Color temperature is also known as white balance and what it does, it measures the light's color. As a quick example to explain white balance is when you look at cars, the older cars have yellow style headlights or they're a bit more on the yellow side, whereas the new ones that have LEDs are more white and that is the different color temperatures. When you're talking about warm colors and cold colors with color temperature, your reds and yellows are your warm and your blues and whites are your cold. Color temperature and white balance are measured in kelvins and you go through the different kelvins to get the different styles. So the lower the kelvin number, the colder the image is, the higher the kelvin number, the warmer it is. Generally, when you're using strobes and things like that, you come out of a 5600 kelvin and that is your daylight balance. On your camera with the different white balances, you have cloudy, sunny and a lot more different ones. All of those have a Kelvin based into it as to the environment as to what sort of colour temperature it should be. You can also select a custom Kelvin number, which I do quite a lot in the studio. I set that to 5600K as a lot of the strobes that we use and also the constant light are set at 5600K. You can also get creative with your images so you can change the colour temperature when you're shooting and it gives you a different look so you can get a warm or a cold feel. If you're doing a photo shoot and you want something really dramatic and dynamic and you were photographing something which had a cool nature, you can drop the Kelvin right the way down and your photograph would be more blue or white shades and your image will look much colder so you can do that without editing the image and that comes straight out of camera. Number seven on the list is long exposure. As we stated earlier with the shutter speed, the longer the shutter speed, the more the shutter is open and this is commonly known as a long exposure photograph. This is a very specific technique and it's used to create a certain type of image. There's no specific shutter speed which is defined as long exposure photography because you can get away with doing it at 1 30th of a second or even 30 seconds. Generally, your long exposure photography is used to blur something. So for example, when we spoke before about the rivers and the water, or if you want to shoot some stars in the night sky, you have a long exposure setting, so a long shutter speed, and that captures all the movement of the stars and they appear on the final photograph. Most people use long exposure in the night time so they can capture images and let in enough light to make the image correctly exposed. Another example is when you shoot in the motorway and you have cars going past, you capture all of those lights. You can also do long exposure during the day, however, you'll need to use an ND filter, which is known as a natural density filter. And what that does is stops the light getting into the lens so you can use a longer shutter speed and not let in enough light so you can achieve the background blur or other blurs during the day. Number eight on the list is focal length. The focal length is to do with the lens. You can get zoom lenses and prime lenses. Zoom lenses have a range of focal lengths. For example, an 18 to 55 mil, you can have a focal length of 80 mil to 55 mil. Prime lens, you can have a 35 mil, 50 mil, 85, etc. And those are set at that focal length. The focal length is the angle of the view and the width of the scene which the subject is in. The smaller the number of the focal length, that means that's the wider it is. So for example, the 18 to 55 mil, at 18 mil, that's quite a wide focal length. And at 55, it's more zoomed in. So you could go on the other aspect of lenses. So you could get a fisheye lens, which is say seven mil. And that is a massive wide lens that you can see all the way around. On the other hand, you can go for a massive zoom lens at say 800mm or 1000mm and that's far zoomed in. So if you're taking a picture of a subject, you need to be quite far back. Each focal length is specific to whatever you want to do pictures of. For example, if you're doing architecture photography, you need a wider lens. If you're doing wildlife photography, you need a bigger zoom lens so you can stay away from the wildlife and still capture the moments. Number nine is digital and optical zoom. So what's the difference between digital and optical zoom? And a lot of cameras like your bridge cameras and things like that, on there it says there's a digital zoom and an optical zoom. Your digital zoom is like a fake zoom. What it does, it takes the image and it zooms in on the image 
and it makes it pixelated and worse quality. However, it's more zoomed in than what the normal image would be. As a result, the photograph is of less quality and more pixelated. What you want to do is if you want to get in closer on a shot, when you've only got your optical and digital zoom, zoom in as far as you can with optical and take that image on the computer and crop it in from there. Once doing that, you can maintain the image quality and your crop will be much better quality and not as pixelated as it would be with digital zoom. So if you can, with using bridge cameras, much prefer to use optical zoom rather than digital zoom. All SLR cameras with your changeable lenses and things like that, there's no digital zoom on that, that's just your optical zoom. So you zoom with your lens and that's it. So you don't have to worry about using the digital zoom and getting more pixelated images. Last but not least on the list is number 10, and that is noise. We've gone over this earlier with regards to ISO when we're talking about noise and the higher the ISO, it lets in more noise. Generally, in photography, when using noise, it causes a lot of confusion between people. However, it's crucial to understand noise and when to use it and how correctly to use it to maximize your photography. So generally, noise happens when you're bumping up your ISO and letting in more light to the camera sensor than what your camera is generally used to or spec'd up to use. For example, most cameras these days can do 1600, 3200 ISO and not get a lot of noise in it. But it's when you go up to figures like 25,600 ISO, that's when a lot of noise comes in and you get a lot of grainy and noisy images. There is software out there so you can reduce noise. So I use Capture One and there's an option in there to reduce noise and also Lightroom, Photoshop and there's programs specifically designed to help with noise. Sometimes noise can be a good thing. So if you're trying to replicate some photographs which are taken a long time ago, you want to recreate them, then generally they would have had noise in because of the times when we're doing the film photography and things. So you can add in some noise and it gives it a more real feel like it would be with film. The other thing which we touched on earlier is if you're doing wedding photography or any sort of documentary photography, sometimes capturing that moment, even if there's noise on it, is much better than not actually capturing it. So if you wanted to use a high shutter speed to capture movement, and obviously you're on your lowest aperture and you need to bump your ISO up to get enough light in, that is acceptable because you're capturing that moment as it was happening and as when it was happening. Whereas if you didn't want noise in your image and use the lower ISO, you'd have to reduce your shutter speed down. And because of this, your images will then be blurry, especially if there's something moving. So like a first dance at a wedding, if people are moving around and you're using a slow shutter speed and a low ISO, the images are going to come out blurry because you're just going to capture all the motion. Whereas if you use a higher shutter speed and a higher ISO, you're going to be able to freeze that motion as it's happening and you're going to get much better images even though you've got noise on. Hope you enjoyed the video and you learned a bit something. I'm going to be shooting a lot more of these videos going through basics and and other intermediate things with regards to cameras, different settings, and also flashes and other things. If there's something specific which you want to learn or you want to do a video on, leave a comment below. And again, if you enjoy the video and want to watch more, please subscribe to the channel, click on the notification bell so you can be updated when the new videos come on, and also give the video a like and a comment. And until next time, see ya.